<laughs> I'll tell you, Adam, we appreciate you leading us in song this morning. Appreciate Daryl and, and uh, Bill, Chad, for the part they've taken in our, our worship already. I do want to apologize to those uh, all, but well, actually, I, I asked Adam's forgiveness already for getting to set this water up here, so I, he wouldn't knock it over. But he used this, and I came up and got my stuff already laid it out here, not thinking that three other men <laughs> would need this space. Uh, so I, I asked forgiveness for that, but uh, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to get to speak to you today. Greg's talked a good bit lately about spiritual gifts and using them. Well, this is not my gift, brothers and sisters, but uh, I am going to do the best I can today. Uh, I am honored to have uh, the opportunity to speak to you today. I want, we're going to be talking about the book of Joel. Uh, maybe you've read it recently, maybe not. Maybe you don't spend much time in the Old Testament, uh, especially in the Minor Prophets. But today we will look uh, at the, his work and part of the, uh, the first part of the book of Joel. Well, Joel was one of the minor prophets, and he is considered a minor prophet because of the length of his work, not because of the lack of importance of his work. Uh, there are only three chapters in the book. It's a short read, uh, and in, but there's so much in it. Uh, a lot of warnings and promises that, that God has made to his people over time. The name Joel uh, means Jehovah or Yahweh is God. So he likely was named uh, into a family who were servants of God. Little is actually known about him. His father's name is given. His name was Bethuel. It appears that he lived in the southern kingdom of Judah because he mentions both Judah and Jerusalem in the book. Joel shares some familiar themes with other prophets, uh, with Isaiah, Amos, Ezekiel, such as the day of the Lord, when God will judge the world and his people. The book may date back as far as the 8th century B.C. during the reign of Joash, who became king of Judah at the age of seven. But it could have been written much later, as late as the 3rd century, because these things that are prophesied have not yet unfolded in, until after that time. But there are not any significant uh, things from history that are mentioned in here that we know happened at a certain time. So we're only uh, left to uh, make our best uh, judgment of when it may have been written. But the people of God uh, needed repeated warnings to turn back to Him. They repeatedly turned away from Him and worshipped idols. They needed repeated warnings to turn from their evil ways. And numerous days of the Lord are mentioned in Scripture, with the final day of the Lord coming at the end of time, which is also mentioned in the book of Revelation. As we read Joel, if you're familiar with it at all, you know that it starts out with a swarm of locusts and, and the story about that. And to give you a little perspective, I want to, this, this swarm of locusts that's described seems unimaginable almost, uh, but it's not that uncommon uh, in, in this part of the world. I want to just, uh, you should look this up. 1915, the uh, Palestine invasion of locusts. There's, there's a lot there, uh, but I'm just going to give you a little introduction here. But swarms of locusts were certainly not of heard of, unheard of in biblical times. In that desert environment, Periodic visitations to vegetated areas um, would be expected. In 1865 was known in Palestine as the year of the locusts. In 1892, fields around Jericho were destroyed. Uh, localized invasions happened again in 1899 and 1904. 
But in Palestine, in February of 1915, just a little over 100 years ago, an invasion began of the locusts. It took hold in, it started in February, took hold in March and April, and lasted until June. And some areas were even affected as late as October. So an invasion of locusts to the people in this area is something they could picture. It may be a little bit more difficult for you and I. We're going to read, first of all, uh, verses 1 through 12, if you want to follow along in a Bible. Uh, Joel chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Bethuel. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children, and let your children tell it to their children, and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land, a mighty army without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. Mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the betrothed of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are mourning those who minister before the Lord. The fields are ruined. The ground is dried up. The grain is destroyed. The new wine is dried up. The olive oil fails. Despair, you farmers. Well, you vine growers. Grieve for the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up and the fig tree is withered, the pomegranate, the palm, the apple tree, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the people's joy is withered away. There are two primary uh, interpretations of this passage. One, and both may apply. Uh, both may have, have occurred in history. I can't get away from the mic. I just have to remember that. I'm used to wandering around. So, uh, The first interpretation is that there is a literal army of locusts, which as we see, and from what I've already discussed, uh, is coming upon the southern kingdom of Judah. And it is going to devastate the land like they cannot imagine. Um, the second, and maybe more likely, uh, interpretation is that the Lord is going to allow armies of invading countries to come in and to overthrow uh, Judah. And eventually we see as we read through Bible and read through other um, books in the Bible, we see that the countries that eventually come in and overthrow Judah, uh, ultimately, uh, Judah and Israel are Assyria, Babylon, Greece, and Rome. They had other local uh, enemies at this time that, that this was written, but ultimately God works in, in His time, not ours, and we see those things eventually evolve. The invasion begins with a mightier version of locusts, uh, the gnawing locusts. The leftovers were eaten by the swarming locusts. There was still a little vegetation left, and in come the young creeping locusts. Eventually, the stripping locusts, or caterpillars, ate up everything else that was available. Throughout the Bible, locusts have been a symbol of destruction and, a, and curse and a powerful consequence of disobedience. I'm going to turn to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28 and read a few verses from there. The first uh, part is from uh, verse 15. 
However, if you do not obey the Lord and do not carefully follow all of His commands and decrees, I am giving you today all these curses will come to you, on you and overtake you. And there he begins with a whole list of curses and things that, uh, repercussions from not following him. Uh, but I want to get down to the part about where he threatens to, to bring uh, locust upon them. Beginning there in verse 38, you will sow much seed in the field, but you will harvest little because locusts will devour it. You will plant vineyards and cultivate them, but you will not drink the wine or gather the grapes because worms will eat them. You will have olive trees throughout your country, but you will not use the oil because the olives will drop off. You will have sons and daughters, but you will not keep them because they will go into captivity. Swarms of locusts will take over all your land and trees you know, and crops of your land. Um, there's a mention even there that it, one day that the children of Judah will be taken into captivity. There's another example of locusts in the Bible being a, uh, a punishment uh, that God brings on people uh, at times. In Exodus chapter 10, Beginning in verse 3. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will bring locusts into your country tomorrow. They will cover the face of the ground so that it cannot be seen. They will devour what little you have left after the hail, including every tree that is growing in your fields. They will fill your houses and those of all your officials and all the Egyptians, something neither your parents nor your ancestors ever have ever seen before from the day they settled until in this land until now. Then Moses turned and left Pharaoh. Over in verse 13, we see this take place. So Moses said, so Moses stretched out his staff over Egypt, and the Lord made an east wind blow across the land all that day and all that night. By morning, the wind had brought the locusts. They invaded all Egypt and settled down in every area of the country in great numbers. Never before had there been such a plague of locusts, and never will there be again. They covered all the ground until it was black. They devoured all that was left after the hail, everything growing in the fields, the fruit of the trees. Nothing green remained on tree or plant in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh, though had a direct command uh, from Moses, from God, to let the people go, he asked for them to let them go into the wilderness to have a period of worship. But Pharaoh declined. So God also brought this tragedy upon Pharaoh. He was openly defiant of God's uh, request. And not only he suffered, but all the Egyptians and the entire country. God cannot tolerate disobedience. Sometimes He has punished the people immediately by utter destruction. Sometimes turning towards God was their only hope, the only choice they had left. Even today, at times, God will not hesitate to show us a lesson if we turn our backs on Him and disobey Him. We need to obey Him in all walks of life, or we will face the consequences of our disobedience. We need to... 
obey Him as uh, Joshua 1 verse 8 says, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. There are consequences of our disobedience. The people in Judah lived as they pleased. Their decisions were not God-centered. Their actions were not God aligned with godly principles. And they kept repeating this pattern over and over. And eventually God threw them out of the picture entirely. God did not overlook their, their disobedience. He intervened. He intervened by disrupting the normalcy of our their lives. The locusts came in and destroyed everything they owned. Let's look again uh, in Joel at verse two. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? And Joel's prophecy is asking the people to think, why do you think this is happening? It's because of your disobedience. Has it ever happened before to this extent in Judah? His answer is no. So God wants us to understand and think about our actions, our lives. The whole act of thinking and reflecting is a means of being aware of the situation at hand and the seriousness of it. God wants them to recognize not only their, their disobedience, but the reason they are being punished. God wants us to reason also, not only in times of tragedy, but always we need to be thinking about how we are living. We must make sure that our words and our actions align with His principles and His will. Verse 3 says, Tell it to your children, and let your children tell it to their children, and their children to the next generation. And so that is how God's will is perpetuated even today. It is essential as parents and grandparents and great grandparents that we pass this warning down to our children and our grandchildren. Children can learn valuable lessons from us if we share some of our challenging experiences with them. Sometimes that may not be very uh, easy to do and certainly needs to be age appropriate. Joel addresses the effect of the plague on the entire nation of Judah and on certain individual classes of people. But certainly God's judgment is upon the entire nation who have gone astray. He first addresses the drunkards and wine drinkers in verses 5 through 7. The very wine that was the center of some of this group's uh, existence, what they lived for for day to day, was going to be taken away from them. And the vines had been destroyed. It may seem at first that God's punishment is unjust or mean, but He knows best what to take away from us in our lives and what needs to be altered so that we, we can lean more toward Him. The next group he addresses is the priests in verses 8 through 10. He says, Mourn like a virgin in a sackcloth, grieving for the betrothed of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. The fields are ruined, the ground is dried up, the grain is destroyed, the new wine is dried up, the olive oil fails. And you see in Exodus 29 and also in Leviticus chapter 2, we read of a detailed report of how to offer grain and drink offerings. Unleavened fine flour was mixed with oil and salt and it was used to make grain offering. 
Roasted fresh heads of grain could be offered as grain offering of first fruits. Drink offering was made from a quarter of a hen of oil and a quarter of a hen of wine. It was approximately one and a half gallons of oil with an equal volume of wine. And these offerings were included in the ceremonial morning and evening sacrifices, which were a vital part of everyday spiritual life in Judah. With the grain destroyed and the wine and oil in Judah dried up, people were unable to make their daily offerings to the Lord. Therefore, God calls on them to mourn because of their inability to offer sacrifice to God. When our spiritual lives enter a dry spell, as most of us will go through if you haven't, we can't remain in those dry lands for long. We need to search for spiritual manna, the clear living water, the Word of God. God calls us to humble ourselves and draw encouragement from His Word. When we see someone who is going through spiritual struggles, we need to reach out to them and to encourage them. Verses 11 and 12. Despair, you farmers, wail, you vine growers. Grieve for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree is withered. The pomegranate, the palm, and the apple tree, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the people's joy is withered away. The farmers of the land are called to lament because of the fruit of the harvest is destroyed. The land is said to be mourning because its principal crops, the grain, the grapes, and the olives are all ruined. Their joy is said to be have withered away and they must turn to God for help. Disobedience to God's word and work in our lives sets the pace for a general withdrawal from him. It takes place so gradually over time that we don't notice it happening. We must be alert to recognize that we are slowly drifting away from Him and reimmerse ourselves in God's love, in His Word, in regular worship, in prayer, and in reaching out to the hurting and the lost. When things go as we planned, we tend to forget that all good gifts come from the Father above. That should never be the case, that God should have to take away our blessings to get us to be drawn to Him spiritually. Beginning in verse 13, Joel shifts the theme of how bad the situation is to, in my words, what can we do to avert this oncoming crisis? And, and here's what he says. Put on sackcloth, you priest, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God. And cry out to the Lord. Mourn and weep. Call a sacred assembly. Put on sackcloth. Be uncomfortable in the judgment that's being brought to you. Fast. Something we don't do a lot of today. In other words, to avoid a national and spiritual tragedy, young and old must come together as a people and commit to turning back to God. Why now? What's the urgency? Verse 15 tells us, Alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. This is not something that is going to be put off forever. God is bringing judgment upon the people and the time is near. And destruction will be take place like they've never seen before. Joel's plea indicates that if the nation repents and turns back to God, it is possible 
that God will not destroy them at this time. God may actually offer them a second opportunity. In Joel chapter 2, it begins with another description of, of how terrible the invasion of the locust uh, will be. It, I will look at uh, verse chapter 2. We'll skip the first part. We go to uh, 2 uh, verse 10. Before them the earth shakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon are darkened, and the stars no longer shine. The Lord thunders at the uh, head of His army. His forces are beyond number, and mighty is the army that obeys His command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? Who can endure it? The answer is found in the next few verses because it really can't be endured. Beginning in verse 12. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. He relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave a blessing behind. Grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. God does not want to bring destruction upon them or upon us today. But unless the nation turns back to God, these things are inevitable. Unless their hearts are sorrowful for the way that they have turned from God, unless they fast and pray, and unless they recommit to living godly lives, their destruction is inevitable. Joel emphasizes that God is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. Turn to God and He may grant you a second chance, He tells them. That message is not just for Judah, it's for you and I today. Beginning in chapter 2, verse 18, uh, Joel describes the Lord's response if the people turn back to Him. Verse, let me find verse 18. Ah. Then the Lord was zealous for His land, and He took pity on His people. The Lord replied to them, I am sending you grain, new wine, and olive oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of the scorn of nations. Skipping to verse 20. Surely he has done great things. Do not be afraid, land of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Verse 25. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. The great locust and the young locust, the other locust and the locust swarm. My great army that I sent among you. But you will have plenty to eat until you are full. And you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. He will restore the pastures, the fruit trees, the fig trees, the grapevines. Things are going to be good as before. As we look back through history, we find that Joel's ultimate, his prophecy ultimately was fulfilled. 
Judah fell as long as as well as Israel. Both the northern and southern kingdoms had been unfaithful to God, and God would only put up with this for so long. They repeatedly had these cycles of disobedience, turning away from God, serving idols, and then with the help of God's prophets, uh, they would turn back and and follow God again. And they did that for a long time, and God finally allowed both nations, Israel and Judah, to be overthrown. Many were carried into captivity for a period of time, but God eventually restored a remnant to the land of promise. God doesn't change. That's great news. He hates evil. When his children turned to evil, he punished them. When they truly repented, he granted them a second opportunity and took them back and blessed them. Being a loving and compassionate God, today he is still offering a second opportunity to those who need to come to Christ. The day of the Lord, the ultimate day of the Lord, that day of final judgment is certainly coming. Beginning in uh, chapter 2, verse 28, Joel shifts his focus to a prophecy about the coming of Jesus, the Son of God, the Holy Spirit, and the final day of the Lord, when all nations will either inherit eternal life or be doomed to eternal destruction. God does not promise us another opportunity to make things right with Him. Today could be our final opportunity. God is promising eternal life and a home in heaven to His faithful children. If you desire to be baptized into Christ, or if you desire to ask for the prayers of this church, we ask you to please come forward as we stand and sing.